Alrighty. So, uh, I think one of the first things I want to do here is I do want to go ahead and implement that, uh, that optimization I was talking about in the last video. Uh, right here where we, uh, we select out the parameter types uh, so that we know how to uh, deserialize the method. Uh, I'm thinking of just uh, going ahead and do, just doing this once during the mapping uh, process and have it so we don't have to invoke the get parameters method and uh, select out the parameters type. I'm actually curious as to what the implementation of get parameters is. Um, uh, of course, it's going to be uh, dynamic. Oh, wow, this is going to be fun. Uh, I just, I just kind of want to see what the actual implementation is. Expected parameters. Either way. I don't want to uh, require the instantiation of an I enumerable anyway, um, in addition to an array. Uh, it's just kind of wasteful. So let's go ahead and start that off. Uh, I'm going to jump over here into the base project, infrastructure namespace, hop on over to our mapped method. And then on our mapped method, I'm going to create a, uh, a new public property. It's going to be public type array parameter types with a public getter and a private setter. Then to uh, initialize parameter types, I'm going to go into the map method constructor. And how about after we set our ID, I'm going to say parameter types equals method info dot get parameters dot select. T goes into T dot parameter type dot to array. And again, this way, this this conversion is only done once or this extraction rather is only done once per mapped method and not every time that method is invoked. All right, so uh, coming in back into client context, now when we read in our arguments, instead of doing method.methodinfo get parameters, we can remove all of that code and replace it simply with parameter types. And that should run a little bit faster, I think. Okay, so um, now that we have that done, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we're going to return values from our uh, from our system methods. So we know that we are returning this IRPC response from our method.invoke, and we know that it's going to be one of three things. It's going to be null for methods that don't return a response, or it's going to be uh, an implementation of an object that implements IRPC response, or it's going to be an object that implements IRPC response of type result. So we need to handle each one of those three cases. And we always need to make sure that if the method does expect a response, that we do return a response as well. So even if the method returns null, I'd probably want to uh, throw a null reference exception. I kind of want to make it so that um, methods that return an IRPC response always return one. The reasoning for that is that it'll be very common on the client side to write code that says, okay, invoke this method on the server, wait for a response. If it's valid, then do that. And if we don't return a response in those cases, the client will hang. We don't want that. So we always want to return something and enforce that something is always returned. Now, fortunately, our mapped method does have this return type property. So we can already extract information about uh, or we already have extracted information about uh, the method and what it should be returning, as well as its uh, accompanying uh, result type. So what we need to do here is um, we need to first see if it's null it, or if it's a void. If it's a void method, then we don't have to worry about anything. If it's not a void method, then we're going to have to return a result to the client. So the in addition to all of that, if this method expects a return, the client needs to know what method that data is being... What I mean is, let's say the client goes ahead and invokes a method like login on the server and expects a return, some sort of return value from the server. Well, unfortunately, we need to know which operation caused that to happen. So to do that, we'll need to have some sort of identifier that is generated every time a method with a return is expected so that when we return back to the client, the client knows which method invocation has completed. So what I'm going to do here is the final line of this method. Um, I'm going to say var result equals method.invoke because we don't know that we'll need it yet uh, in the case of this method returning void. 
but uh, if we uh, if we do need it, it'll be nice to have that that local variable. Then I'm going to say if method dot result type equals method uh, what did I call that mapped method return type that's uh, return type Derp. return type equals map method return type void then just return because we're done uh, there's no response needed however if it's not void meaning it's an irpc result or it's if it's a response or a response with a result then we need to make sure that result is not null so i'm going to say if result is null throw new null reference exception and i'll say please uh return an irpc response or i RPC response of T non void system methods. Okay, so now that we have that information, uh, let's go ahead and extract out the, uh, the the unique ID that's going to be used to determine uh, which method invocation this is on from the client's perspective. So I'm going to say um, var system invocation system invoke ID equals, and I'm going to extract that out of our parameters dictionary, and I'm going to cast it to a byte, because I'll use a byte for this. I'm going to cast that to a byte, and I'm going to say operation parameter, and I'll call this system invoke ID. And of course, of course I'll get a key not found exception if this, uh, if this was not sent, which is what I want. Okay, so now I have the actual result, and I also have the... Um, the system invoke ID, as in the the thing, uh, the callback ID to invoke on the client once we've uh, responded. What we need to do is we need to extract out information about the result. So this is where things get interesting because we have to start thinking about creating a concrete implementation of the IRPC response uh, uh, interface because we'll need that information to be able to extract out what we're going to send back to the client. Now we can already extract out if we do result dot um, okay what is that uh, IRPC response oh I never actually put anything in IRPC response so that's why but we can already extract out our um, our operation errors and whether or not the thing was valid, and that's easy. The only difficult part is going to be extracting out the return type value. So um, let's go ahead and uh, and set up our IRPC response interface and our IRPC response of T result interface. I'm not going to worry about creating the concrete types of this yet until we move on to actually implementing the client, because we're not going to have to worry about creating the concrete types yet. So an IRPC response, we're going to have an I enumerable of string, and we're going to call these operation errors with a getter. And then we're also going to have a bool is valid with a getter for our IRPC response. Now our IRPC response of T result is going to have, in addition to all that, it's going to have a T result result property. And that'll be that. So now we have this information that we can extract out of these interfaces and send back to the client. So jumping back into client context, what I can do now is we have our operation errors already and, we, and our is okay or is valid by just doing result dot. We have is valid and operation errors right there because remember result is of type IRPC response. However, if we're working with a um, a IRPC response of T, we also need to extract additional information out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in an if statement. I'm going to say if method dot return type equals response, then what I'm going to do, now this is going to be interesting, I'm going to invoke a method that doesn't exist yet, but bear with me. I'm going to do transport dot send operation, or how about... Um, uh, there's two ways I can do this. I can make this more abstract or I can make it more concrete. I think I'm just going to make this more concrete. I'm just going to say transport dot, um, uh, how about, what do we want to call this? No, invoke method on, so our, this is invoke method on system. So let's go ahead and uh, send system method response. 
How about send system response? And I'm going to pass in the system invoke ID, and then I'm going to pass in the result, which will include our operation errors and whether or not we're valid. Otherwise, we know that we're working with a uh, response with result in this case. Let me go ahead and get rid of those curlies. Those curlies are kind of ugly. So now we have to, in this case, because we know we're working with response with result, we need to extract out this t result result. And there's a couple of ways we can do this. Probably the fastest way, the fastest way would be to add a property on IRPC response and have it of type object. And then have the result and this new property on IRPC response return the same object. So we have the typed result for convenience and then we have the object result on the IRPC response for in uh, speed, basically. Because really the only alternative of accessing this property on this interface is to um, do some reflection, some ugly reflection that will uh, take a while to, um, or not be particularly efficient. We could do dynamic memory or dynamic method compilation, but that's not particularly trivial. So I'm just going to go with the simplest solution here that gives us um, the best performance, I think. And that is on the IRPC response. Of course, this breaks, you know, object-oriented design a little bit. Uh, but unfortunately, that's just things that we have to deal with. Uh, an alternative to this even would be to create another interface that has this object and then have it so that our implementations of IRPC response implement the other interface and then cast it to the other interface in the client context class. Uh, I, I think that this is just going to be the easiest way to get around this. We can revisit this design later. So I'm just going to say un typed response is what I'm going to call this. So this is kind of like an internal thing. You can think of this as kind of an internal thing that we should never really use, uh, or actually untyped result is what I want. But it's there for uh, making a trade-off between performance and, uh, and ease of use. So then going into our client context, uh, what I'm going to do here is we need to serialize the response first, and then we need to send it to the transport. So to serialize it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say using var ms equals new memory stream. I'm going to initialize the, well, no, I can't because then it's set. Ah, I hate the memory stream so much. Then I'm going to say var using var bw equals new binary writer. Then I'm going, or passing in ms. Then I'm going to say um, application.serializer.write object, passing in our binary writer. The type is going to be method.result or return type. And the value or result, is it result? Uh, that's such a confusing name. I don't know what's result type. I'm going to have to change those names too at some point. And the value is going to be result.untyped result. Then, after we've done the serialization, I'm simply going to do transport.send system response, passing in system invoke ID. Or I'll do send system. No, I'll just do send system response, I guess. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go with that. Uh, then I'm going to pass in result. And then finally, as a third parameter, so I'm going to have an overload here. Um, I'm going to pass in ms.toArray. So yeah, so this handles our returning. Now, a, a thing you might notice if you're paying close attention, this does not uh, handle asynchronous returns. What I mean by that is, let's say the, uh, the, the system wants to only send the return after some oper other operation, like an IO operation, completes. This won't handle that. Uh, we can revisit the system later if it ever becomes important for us to be able to handle those cases. But for now, uh, this will do for what we want to have happen. Of course, this is going to require us adding a couple new methods. Uh, the send system response we'll have to add to our transport. We'll also have to add a um, operation parameter system invoke ID. 
So I'm going to come up here to our base project infrastructure namespace. I'm going to hop over to our operation parameter. And I'm going to add system invoke ID as a new enumeration member. And you'll notice that that now is working. Since we're in uh, the base infrastructure namespace at the moment, I do want to go ahead and introduce uh, two new enumerations. And those are going to be our operation response enumerations. So on the infrastructure uh, namespace, I'm going to add operation response code. And the operation response code, uh, I guess we're going to give it um, We go ahead and give it two member. Well, first let's make sure that our backing type is a byte. Then I'm going to give it two. I'm going to say um, um, for response, or how about ah, server system response and server system response with result. So that's why we'll be able to uh, distinguish between the two things. And then in our infrastructure namespace, we'll also have to add a operation response uh, parameter. And our parameters are going to be um, system invoke ID, which we'll need to know so the client knows which callback to invoke. Uh, what is I was amused, that's why. Uh, we'll need our operation errors, we'll need our is valid, and we'll need our result. Or how about we're, we're going to call this result bytes so that we uh, kind of get an idea that it's been already serialized. All right, so we have that. Uh, we'll make sure the backing type is a byte. Let's hop on over to back to our client context. So now we see that our transport interface is now lacking the two methods that we need, our send system response methods. So let's go ahead and fix that. I'm going to hop on over to the uh, server assembly and go into the iServer transport interface. Let's see here. So I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of new methods. I'm going to say send system response with a byte system invoke ID and a IRPC uh, response, which comes from the base infrastructure namespace, response. Then I'm going to add another method, send system response byte system invoke ID, IRPC response response, and then byte result bytes, so that we have our serialized result bytes. So those are the two methods uh, that we have that we'll be using. All right, let's go ahead and hop out here. And um, now we're going to have errors on our peer, which I don't know if we've really implemented our peer at all yet. No, we haven't. Well, no, wait a sec. Oh, um, our, in our test, in our uh, test base, uh, component map test, uh, test RPC response, we have to implement those new members that we added to the IRPC response. Remember, we added our operation errors, invalid and untyped results. Uh, in our test, we have to make sure that we also implement those. I'm just going to use ew. I'm just going to use Resharper to go ahead and just give dummy implementations to all of these uh, all these things. There we go. So I just filled in all the things that are required to be implemented. Uh, nothing really of consequence since we don't use any of those uh, actual properties for making our tests work. Okay, so yeah, now we'll go ahead and have to, um, let's not worry about implementing our iTransport yet because we don't even have a uh, thing there for that. Let's go ahead and um, implement our event writer at least as far as we can. So we have our player init request or add system, remove system, invoke method on system. Uh, player init is uh, sent on a player connect. So what we want to do here is um, we want to serialize down our two component maps is actually all we really need to do here. 
uh, we serialize down those component maps and we shoot them off to the player. So remember, we're in our event writer right now. It needs to return an event that uh, will be cached and sent to all players as they are initialized. So to do that, let's go ahead and save our using ms equals new memory stream um, using var bw equals new binary writer uh, passing in memory stream. We're going to have to instantiate a um, component map serializer. So we'll say saver equals new con or formatter equals new component map binary formatter. Then I'm going to say formatter dot uh, save application dot actors component map. And we'll, oh, I have to pass in the binary writer, of course. And I'll say formatter save binary writer application dot uh, player systems component map. Now we need to turn this into an event. So I'm going to say var parameters equals new dictionary uh, byte object. So for the first thing we need to say we need or I guess all we're going to be sending are, are these component map bytes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the event code parameter enumeration right here event code parameter which is located under our base infrastructure event code parameter and I'm going to add a uh, component map bytes to that. That'll be that. So we're going to send a uh, component map, or sorry, event code parameter dot component map bytes passing in ms dot two array. And those are really all the parameters that we're going to need for this event. Now we need an actual event code and uh, to instantiate an event. So I'm going to say return event dot from dictionary, passing in event code dot init player, a dictionary of parameters, and a send parameters of um, unreliable is false, which is the default. So I'm just going to return a new send parameters. Actually, I'm going to one up this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go into my event class here. So I'll leave this code up here for you guys to look at while I do this. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to create a couple uh, public static read-only event parameter presets or send parameter presets, or at least one for now. I'm going to say public static read-only, uh, what, what are these called again? Send parameters. So remember, I'm in the event class under the buzzmo server. I'll do send parameters. And I'm going to call this reliable equals new send parameters. And then I'm going to initialize it with a um, unreliable of false, just to be explicit about that. Now, what's really important to note is that we're not going to actually get any real performance savings from doing this this way. And the reason for that is our send parameters are um, our, our structures and uh, structures need to be copied. I guess, um, how bad is this? Two bytes, three bytes, four bytes? Well, it's really just four bytes. So I don't really care too much. It'll just make the code a little bit cleaner though by having these uh, presets right here in our event class. So I'm gonna close out of the event class Instead of passing in new send parameters, I'm going to pass in event.reliable. Okay, now we just need the init player event code and we'll be good. Uh, I'm not going to worry about doing that just yet because I want to go ahead and implement these other three methods first. So the add system method um, passes in a registered system. All we need to do is tell it to instantiate its client interface type ID. Uh, so client interface type. Actually, the registered system, I don't have the ID of, the component ID of. I'm going to go ahead and change the signature of add system um, because the registered system, if you recall, only has the concrete type, server interface type, and client interface type. It doesn't have any of the IDs. And I need the ID to tell the client which system to create. So I'm going to add a new parameter to it. 
and it's just going to be component or mapped component, and it'll be client interface component. I don't even really need to pass in the registered system, honestly. I just need to know what the client interface component is. So for add system, uh, I'm going to say var parameters equals new dictionary of byte object. Um, we'll have a parameter of byte event code parameter. We're going to call this client interface component ID. Or how about client interface type ID? I think that's the, the language we've been using. And with the value of client interface component dot ID, which is a byte. Then I'm going to say return event dot from dictionary event code dot add system, passing in our parameters and passing in event dot reliable as our send parameters. Remove system is going to be the same thing. Uh, we're going to have a mapped component, client interface component, and var parameters equals new dictionary byte and object. Uh, we're going to pass in a uh, cast a byte event code parameter dot component map or whoops what am I doing dot client interface type ID passing in client interface component dot ID we're going to return event dot from dictionary event code dot remove system this time passing in our parameters and passing in event dot reliable. Now we have invoke method on system, which we're going to say parameters equals new dictionary byte object, blah, 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 uh, byte event code parameter. So for the parameters, we need to send for an invoke method on system. We ne first need to send the client interface ID, which we have provided right there. Then we need to send the method ID. So we'll do event code parameter dot method ID passing in method.id, and then we need to um, send in the arguments, which we have not serialized. But fortunately, we have an event, a, a, uh, an iSerializer at top. So before we can complete this, we need to serialize our arguments. So I'm actually going to do this uh, up on a line above. Um, I'm going to say byte, argument bytes, and I'm going to say using var ms equals new memory stream using var w equals new binary writer. And then I'm going to, or passing in ms. Then I'm going to say serializer dot write arguments, passing in the binary writer, the method dot parameter types, and the arguments themselves. Then I'm going to say argument bytes equals uh, ms dot to array. So yeah, there's a lot of copying and stuff going on here. Um, we're going to be writing code to actually profile all of this uh, in a later chapter. But for now, we're just going to uh, do with what works. And uh, it's good that we have all the bits that we can easily identify as being potentially problematic kind of uh, consolidated in one place, making changing their implementation easier. Anyway, we've now serialized the uh, arguments so we can add it to our parameters dictionary. Event code parameter dot argument bytes or arguments bytes. I know it sounds weird to have two plurals like that, but I think it makes the most amount of sense. And then we're going to have pass an argument bytes. Which, to be consistent, I'm going to rename argument bytes to arguments bytes. And then I'm simply going to return event dot from dictionary, passing in event code dot invoke method on system parameters and event dot reliable all right so i think that pretty much wraps up our event writer uh, let's go ahead and uh, throw in our um, enumeration items as well so our event code parameters and our event codes both need a little bit of love because, uh, as you can see, uh, we haven't added those in. So I'm going to bring event code parameter over here on the side. And I'm just going to add things as I see them. So uh, I could do this through ReSharper too. A really quick way to do this, if you guys have ReSharper installed, is to um, 
use alt page up and page down to cycle through errors click on get get your mouse uh, keyboard cursor on the first instance of uh, an enumeration member not existing hit alt enter and then enter and it'll create that member then hit alt page down again alt enter enter page down again alt enter enter page down and so on and so on and you can really quickly create all of your um all of your uh, things you know what i'm saying well actually i think when you hit alt enter enter it switches you over to the enumeration the member was added to so to get quickly back to it without leaving the keyboard you just hit uh, control comma enter so the process would be alt enter enter control comma enter alt page down alt enter enter control comma and so on but for the people who don't have um, three sharper installed i'm going to go ahead and do this manually so we're doing event code parameters first so we have component map bytes we'll need client interface type id which you see resolves both of those problems. Uh, we also noticed that I had a slight spelling mistake right here. Uh, I want to go ahead and re reuse the client interface type ID right there. So I'm going to reuse it there on that event code parameter. We'll need our method ID and we'll need our argument bytes. I'm starting to notice a couple of inconsistencies that are annoying me, but we'll deal with them later. Uh, like. I'm referring to client interface component ID right here, but then I'm doing client interface type ID right there. It's kind of annoying, but it's not going to end the world. All right, so now let's uh, take our event code, plop it over to the side there. So this is our event code enumeration located in our infrastructure namespace. And I'm going to add all our event codes. In. We need init player, add system, remove system, and invoke method on system. that's it. Uh, our event writer should be pretty much done as far as we need to be. Uh, obviously, we're going to be adding in a lot more events to deal with the actors implementation. But of course, we're not worrying about actors at the moment. We're just worrying about bi-directional system communication. So yeah. Uh, the next step would be to resolve these errors. Oh, yeah, uh, I have two errors now, um, and they're in my client systems um, class. So under BuzzMO server, client systems, you'll notice I have two errors for adding and removing systems, because remember I changed the add system signature to accept a mapped component. We can fix this really easily by instead of passing in registered system, we simply pass in client component. You'll notice that by passing in client component, we no longer need to even get the registered system. And we know that because uh, ReSharper grayed this out for us, um, indicating that this local variable isn't used anywhere else. So we can safely remove it, which will save us from a uh, dictionary lookup, which is always nice. All right, uh, let's scroll down to the next error, and that's right here in our destroy method. So our destroy method, um, what we need to do Okay, so what we need to do is instead of doing var registered system, because it looks like registered system is only used to remove the system, um, instead of doing this, I'm going to remove this line entirely. And I'm going to say var Client component equals client dot system component map dot get component passing in system dot client system interface type. And then when I invoke the remove system method, I'm going to pass in client component instead of the registered system, which will resolve that error. Uh, the next thing I want to do is purely cosmetic. This is irritating me how I have this whole inline uh, client transport send data that I pass in right there, but this is not inline. I break it out into a local variable and then invoke it. Uh, Performance-wise, it's not going to make a difference because of optimization. Uh, Aesthetics-wise, I would prefer this to be inlined. So the easiest way to inline something, if you have a sharper, hit Control shift r and then Enter. Uh, these, the other way to do it would be to take what's on the right hand side of the equal sign, select it, cut it, uh, click on what's inside these parens, and paste it, 
and then remove the top line. Either way, I think that looks a little bit nicer. All right. So I think that's just about uh, going to wrap things up. I mean, honestly, all we really have left is implementing our peer. And then we can move on to the client. And then after we move on to the client, we could finish our IRPC response and test everything out and see some action. So that'll be really cool. Anyway, guys, I'll see you in the next video.